Hello peeps. Now here's the thing. This is like the fourth time I've had to reshoot this video and it has to do with the following reasons which are also disclaimers. One, I'm gonna touch upon some heavy stuff so consider this a content warning. I'm gonna be touching on suicide and suicide prevention and if that triggers anybody's PTSD that's totally okay. I've got links to stuff down below that doesn't contain any of those. Two, I rewrote this vlog to contain just a few jokey moments, but I don't intend to undermine how serious the issue of suicide prevention is. Also, you don't always need dank meme edits to push your point. Three, this whole vlog is based on a very tiny amount of information that I could get in English. Surely more info about my video subject is out there, but it's mostly written in Japanese, which I'm still teaching myself. So some of what I'm about to say is going to be guesswork. If you'd like to provide info or even correct something I'm gonna say, don't hesitate to comment below. Four, this vlog is more of an than it is a critical study. I originally wanted to compare how the departed are remembered now versus back then, but I haven't been able to find empirical data for that, and I don't have much time to. I've got other videos to make. With all that said, let's go. Greetings to all that's holy and unholy, I'm Jeff, and if you've been following my Twitter for a while, you will have noticed that I've been a huge Japanese Idol fan. I've mainly been tweeting about the Sakamichi series, Equal Love, and the more obscure Dots Tokyo. But while I was browsing the net for stand material a few months back, I bumped into the story of one idol, active in the 80s but seemingly remembered for just one thing. If you excuse me, allow me to go pull off an extra history here. Prologue. The year is 2000. Baseball player Kenjiro Kawasaki gets an offer to play for the Boston Red Sox, but he refuses. The official stated reason is that his wife just doesn't want to bother to move stateside with him. A couple of months later though, an article about that same decision emerges in a newspaper, and its writer speculates another reason. The death of his former flame, Kazumi Kawai. Let's go and rewind for a bit. It's 1982. Young singers like Seiko Matsuda and Yu Hayami have become very popular with the masses. In the background of all that though, a girl named Tomoko Kuga, Kazumi Kawai's actual name at birth. And sadly, that's pretty much the only info I could find on Kawai's early life. So for now, let's just go assume that she is just your 1980s typical Tokyo teenager. Until one day, a film director, Mamoru Watanabe, discovers her and asks if she wants to star in some pink films. You know, sexy movies. During this time, it was common for Japanese companies to make these kinds of films so that they could help pull in cash for more serious and not so sexy work. Kuga accepts and she takes up the stage name Kazumi Kawai. Her film debut is not surprisingly called Lusty Discipline in uniform. Its plot is something I don't want to talk about given how my Twitter sphere has just recovered from a major sexual misconduct exposure, so just Google the thing at your own discretion. But because of that movie, Kawaii's career as an adult model begins. Searching her in Google Images is bound to bring up more than a couple of risque pics. After doing this for a while though, people start noting that she has a resemblance to a certain Akina Nakamori. Nakamori is a big deal because she's also a successful idol singer like Seiko Matsuda and Yu Hayami. So the following year, she's invited to sing on a comedy spin-off show called Hyokin Best of 10. Think Killer Karaoke plus Top 10 Music Show, but all the distractions are done by a comedy team, the Hyokin Zoku, wearing ridiculous costumes and, you know, not actual snakes. So what did Kazumi have to do with that show? For a whole bunch of episodes where Nakamori's hits are the top songs, Kawai steps in to be Nakamori. Which is kind of weird if you ask me. Was it expensive to actually get the real singer? You were already inviting like actual talents. I, I don't know. After a while it soon becomes apparent that she is more than just a face. On some of her appearances, she sings in this very tender, low, sweet singing voice. 
And because of that, somewhere along the line, her management, most likely, has a dream. What if, what if Kawhi was a legit idol singer and not some professional impersonator? Then that dream was real. On a Hyokin appearance, February of the following year, her impersonation is finally deemed as NG. Not good. Welp! Is it over for this young woman? No. On the contrary, in a Scooby-Doo-like moment, people find out who fake Akina really is. When on another Hyokin Zoku segment, this time themed upon the idea of the confession booth, the name Kawaii Kazumi is finally flashed, and she confesses her sin to some parody saint. Unfortunately, she is just punished instead via ice bucket challenge. This paves the way for the Japanese public to accept that a new star has been born. Just a few months later, she releases her first original song called Shunkan Musume. Over the next two years, she releases two studio albums and a whole bunch of video releases. She has made that transition from budget Akina to idol herself. In 1986, she makes the shift into becoming a TV actress, acting in several dramas including an adaptation of the manga Hatsukoi Scandal. But the 90s would prove to be a turning point. Somewhere within that period, she meets this nice-looking guy who also happens to be a baseball player for the occult swallows, Kenjiro Kawasaki. They have a fling, and then break it off. By 1995, she's well-known as a talent, but watching clips of her from this period shows off something unsettling. She looks gloomy, eerily gloomy. Rumors of an affair between her and Kawasaki were beginning to swirl around this time. And it matters at the very least for her because she was already about to be engaged to another man. And of course, this being Japan, you know how serious they can sometimes take the concept of honor. And if you add that she was allegedly very apprehensive about living the married life and that for a time in her life she wasn't even herself, and you get three possible and valid sources for stress and anxiety. Now, I can't say if these three things were completely responsible for making Kazumi Kawai depressed. One thing's for sure, she was. And that depression came to a climax on May 9th, 1997. On that day, she goes to an apartment complex and jumps from its seventh floor. What was sad is that that was the place where her former flame was living in at that time. What was even sadder is that in a TV drama that she acted in, she played a character who tried to kill herself. Earlier this year, we've seen celebs be taken away by suicide. Avicii, Anthony Bourdain, Kate Spade. But as wrong as this sounds, I've observed that they're fortunate enough to have perished in such a way that it's so easy to trace their legacy. Kazumi Kawai, on the other hand, not so much. You ask me, what does the death of a random idol singer that never got to god tier have to do with legacy and remembering. I did say in my first essay vlog this year that thinking different ways matters, and that's the framework that I'm using here. Side story but relevant, I want to tell you about Kevin Briggs. He's a former police officer who's now spending his time as a mental health advocate. Why? Because he had a special job when he was still in the force, and that was to stop people from jumping to their deaths at the freaking Golden Gate Bridge. He knows he can't remember the stories of everyone that has tried, but that doesn't stop him from caring. In a 2014 TED Talk, he recounted three stories that involved him trying to stop someone from jumping. Two people did, and one of them he managed to talk down successfully. Whether he succeeds or fails in his mission, family members of those depressed and affected would often try to get in touch with him. This allowed Briggs to see the people that he saved as more than just a statistic. Compare this to the kind of algorithmically enforced way that I got to know of Kazumi Kawai. Almost every Google result from her comes from either a sketchy source or a ripoff of Wikipedia that even states the same sentence 
as her actual English article. It's like she's barely remembered as an idol singer at all, and she's just the girl who died. And that's frustrating to me. Now, I have guesses as to why her story is not so out there. Japan does have that culture of wanting things to go non-bothersome. And of course, it was harder to transmit stories internationally. But even if that was the case, I still care. Because even idols who don't get AKB48 famous were still human beings that meant something to someone. The suicide itself says something about how the Japanese entertainment industry was back then and how it could turn out now if agencies and managers don't take care of their talents as mental health. But my main point, giving a crap about suicide prevention is more than just telling someone that they matter just as they're about to die. I'm not a mental health professional, but it's part and parcel to notice a person as their complex whole self that still needs to interact with the community. In other words, it's telling that the living matter and remembering that the dead did. There's a YouTube channel called R6725. Most of its videos are of Kazumi Kawai's old TV appearances. Almost all of them end with an English phrase written at the bottom. Kazumi, let's meet again someday. Depending on the person that runs the account, it's either an unhealthy obsession or a moving tribute. I happen to think that it's the latter. Because at the moment, this YouTube channel shows off something that English Wikipedia doesn't. It shows off a girl who had to smile under the spotlight of fame. Who had to hide whatever it is that she was really feeling at that time in the name of her idolhood, in the name of her fans. Legacies aren't all objective stuff. When Kevin Briggs says, The collateral damage of suicide affects so many people. He means that legacies are also the meanings of ourselves that we leave behind too. And that's important to remember, especially when there are narratives that are being erased or undermined by the powers that be. Wanting to remember is good enough, but remembering that these people meant at all is just as important, maybe even more important. I hope that's the way Kazumi Kawai gets to be remembered in the future, the way that R6725 does now. Not just an entertainer who jumped, but as someone whose career was able to affect people, whether it was a photo shoot, a TV drama, or a song. Sure, she never got as big as her fellow idols, but she meant something to someone else even if she had to become an idea of herself to do so. That is something that won TV credit and she committed suicide by jumping from an apartment building can't communicate so well. I've been Jeff, and thanks for hearing me out. Somebody gonna have to tell the truth and I'm gonna tell it! video was an adventure. Anyway, I just talked about an obscure deceased idol. If anyone has info, corrections, and even opinions, go ahead and comment down below. This channel is meant to be a discussion starter. But here's what's more important. When I was talking about Kawhi's death, the weather actually got a lot less sunny, and now that I'm filming the outro, it's sunny again. I don't have the chops for mental health advocacy, but I still care. If you're going through depression and or suicidal thoughts, I've also linked a bunch of stuff in the description below that will help you get help. Rich or poor, for better or for worse, there will always be stress and problems. But I want you to know that you're not suffering through life alone. We should be all in this together. And maybe, just like this shoot, It'll get sunnier in the end. I know today was pretty heavy, but I will upload something lighter. I need to prepare myself for the professional editing life, y'all.